Uh, okay, uh, hello, uh, great. Welcome everyone back to class. Um, so today we will be talking um, about dimensionality reduction. Um, and we'll talk about two, two methods. One is called the singular value decomposition and the other one is called the CUR decomposition. Um, and both these methods will kind of, the idea will be that we want to reduce dimensionality of the data. And this will become very handy um, next week when we talk about recommender systems. Uh, uh, the lecture today and then again next week on Thursday will be kind of linear algebra heavy. So we'll be thinking a lot about matrices, okay? And uh, here is kind of what we will be doing and what we want to do, right? We, will, we can often take data and, re and represent it as a big uh, M by N matrix where we have M rows and M columns, right? As you know, as we did it with Shingling and so on, right? And this, and the idea is that this matrix can be co closely approximated by a product of ma ma matrices that share small common dimension uh, R, right? So the idea is that I can take this M by N matrix and represent it as a product of three different matrices of, you know, I have matrix U that's very skinny, right? Very, very narrow, uh, but has M rows and some R columns where R is, let's say, something small. I will then have this R by R matrix here and another matrix that is wide that has as many columns as the original matrix and it has R rows, right? And this is what we mean by uh, matrix decomposition where we want to take one matrix and and decompose it into a product of smaller matrices. And this is kind of what we will be doing today. So with this intuition or this kind of high level, let me now give you some examples and what do we want to do and how would this work, right? So what we want to do is we want to compress our data. We want to reduce dimensionality, right? Um, and uh, you know, the idea is that we are maybe willing to do that with, if we have a bit of error, right? So imagine I give you this type of data. This is my data matrix. Uh, where I have different customers and you know how many orders they placed uh, every uh, on these particular days, right? So this would, for example, mean that you know this particular GCI uh, incorporated placed one order on Friday the 12th, right? And I can think this of this as my data matrix. And what I can do is if I say I want to reduce dimensionality, I can find out that I really have only two types of rows in this, uh, in this, in this matrix. I have rows that basically have something, 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 zero, zero, and others that have three, zero, and something, something, right? So what this means is that my data is really not, uh, you know, let's say five dimensional, right? That every customer is a five dimensional data point. Really, my, my data matrix is only two dimensional. What does this mean? This means that I can represent every row either as something that is, you know, one, 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 zero, zero, or zero, zero, one, one. And if these are my new, let's say, coordinates, my new dimensions, then every row here can be now represented in these new coordinates, right? So for example, uh, row number, uh, uh, number four can be represented as five comma zero because I take five times this row and I add zero times that row. Right? While, for example, this row here or this one here in red can be represented as zero two, right? I take zero times uh, this particular row plus two times that particular row, right? And if I multiply this by, by two, becomes zero, 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 two, two, which is exactly that row, right? So what did we do? Rather than representing every customer using five numbers, I can represent every customer using just two numbers in this new coordinate system, if you like, where these are now my axis, right? Uh, are, uh, our customers are along these two axes. So this is kind of how, you know, high dimensional data is really low dimensional data. So this is really two dimensional data, even though it seems it's in five dimensions, okay? So this was an example. And of course, what we'll do today is figure out methods that automatically discover these dimensions and allow us to compress dimensionality of the data. That's the idea. Right? So kind of what's the idea of dimensionality reduction? The idea is that I have data in high dimensions, but really data occupies kind of a lower dimensional manifold in this embedding space, right? So I can think my coordinates are given in two dimensions, but really my data just l lays along this line. Or I could think that my data coordinates, my ambient space is in three dimensions, but really the data itself only covers this plane that I show you here, right? So really 
you know, even though the coordinates are in three dimensions, this data is two dimensional. If I know the, the two vectors describing the plane, I just have to say where on this plane you are, rather than thinking of three dimensional coordinates. Or in this case, right, if I know the line, I, all I have to say is how far along the line a point is. Of course, I will get a bit of error because l l uh, dots don't perfectly uh, sit on the line, but I can just say how far along, along the line are you to determine the position of the point and this way um, reduce dimensionality. And these latent dimensions of the data, they are called latent factors or latent dimensions, right? These are these intrinsic dimensions of the data that the coordinates themselves don't, um, uh, uh, don't reveal. And our goal is to identify this, these dimensions in which the data really uh, is positioned, okay? So, um, and uh, right, how would you, how intuitively, how would we do this, right? These dimensions, these latent dimensions, these latent factors, the way we will think of them is that the first latent dimension is the dimension in which the data has the highest variance, right? And then, you know, the second dimension is the direction that is orthogonal to the first, but has the second largest variance, right? And so on and so on until, you know, we are able to sufficiently describe the data and the remaining variance is low, right? So the idea is that we want to find axis of, in some sense, maximal variation so that our data will be well described. And if, if we have axis, let's say if I would have an axis this way, where the variation is small, I don't care about that dimension. I really care about this dimension because the variation, the variance, the spread here is very large. And you know, the orthogonal dimension to it, this one, I don't care so much because data is really like close to the line, right? So the variance there is small, okay? And, um, now with kind of this intuition, let's start to build more of it, right? So one question is how would I measure dimensionality of the matrix? And rank of a matrix, es matrix essentially uh, measures dimensionality, right? Because you know, what is the rank of the matrix? Rank is the number of linearly independent rows in the matrix, right? So if I go back to my original example, if you think of this, there were only Two, lin uh, two rows that are linearly independent, right? It is, it is, you know, one row from here and one row from there. All these other rows linearly depend on each other. They're just kind of a scaled version of the first row, right? So if I would say, what's the rank of this matrix? The rank of this matrix is two, which means that with two dimensional coordinates, we can exactly represent uh, this matrix, okay? So, um, you know, give you a bit more interesting example. Here I have a matrix and you can ask, you know, is this a rank two, is it a rank three matrix? And you know, it turns out this is a rank two matrix because if you write it out in, in the following coordinates, right? One, zero, 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 one, zero. So this is kind of, this is X axis, this is Y axis, this is Z axis. Then your points can be represented that way. But if you uh, define new basis vectors, new coordinate system that is, let's say, the, uh, the following, then you can rewrite your original data points with only two coordinates each, right? So now coordinate, so the data point C, which is uh, uh, 3, 5, 0, is really um, the first vector uh, minus the second vector, right? So in the new coordinate system, the data point C has the following coordinates, where this is the new coordinate system, right? So again, what do we notice? We reduce the number of dimensions from three dimensions, right? Three numbers per point to two numbers per point, right? So if you would were to compute what's the rank of this matrix, th this matrix has rank two because it's really two dimensional, not three dimensional, okay? Um, right, and what's the goal of dimensionality reduction is to discover this axis, right? To automatically discover this axis so that we can reduce dimensionality of the data or more compactly represent our data, right? Um, and right, the idea is that rather than using the original ambient space, we wanna compress the data. And by doing so, we may incur a bit of error, um, but we are fine with that, right? Because we really kinda wanna see what is the large scale structure of the data. So that's the idea for what we wanna do and how we are going to think about it. So I'll talk now about uh, singular value decomposition where here is what singular value decomposition is. I take my original data matrix A, 
that doesn't have to be square. It can be whatever is the dimensions. Um, and I will represent it as a product of three matrices, U, sigma, and V transpose. Um, and uh, there are strong constraints that I will explain on the structure of U, sigma, and V that result in a unique decomposition. So any real valued matrix has a unique decomposition into uh, these three matrices U sigma and V transpose. And from um, this decomposition, we can choose R to be, uh, to, be, to be whatever we want, right? So this R, we can choose what is the, how many dimensions do we want to reduce our representation to. Um, in this case, if I would take matrix A and fully decompose it, then R would be the rank of the matrix. But I could also choose R to be less than the rank of the matrix, and this way do the, do the dimensionality reduction. And SVD does it in the following way, that it minimizes the reconstruction error. And I will explain what minimizing reconstruction error means, okay? So defining singular value decomposition, we take data matrix A and we represent it as a product of three matrices. Um, A is the input data matrix. Matrix U, I will call the matrix of left singular vectors. So every row of this matrix U is a singular vector. Um, the dimensionality of matrix U is it has M rows and uh, R, R columns or R singular vectors. Then I will have a matrix sigma of what we call singular values matrix. This is a di diagonal matrix, so we'll only have non-zero values uh, along the diagonal. And then I will have the matrix V. Uh, this is the, the matrix uh, up here, this one, which I will call the right singular values, um, the singular vectors. And this is now a, a N columns and, uh, sorry, N rows and R columns. Or if I write it in the transpose way, then it's N, uh, N uh, columns and R rows. Where again, R is the rank of the matrix A. Um, so, now, how can I write this out? One way I can write this out is using the, 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 uh, the, vec the matrix product uh, up there on the left. But I also can write it uh, in this other way, which is the, the outer product, where this is, you know, I go over all, the sing uh, over all the singular values. This is the singular value times the left singular vector. Uh, and then I do the outer product with the right singular vector, right? And here is how am I visualizing uh, to do this, right? So I can think of it this way to, to reconstruct uh, uh, matrix uh, A, um, or I can think of it uh, that way to reconstruct matrix A, okay? Um, so that's the idea. Now, what are some properties of this singular value decomposition? The first property is that for any given matrix A, the U sigma and V are unique. So it means there will always be just one solution, not multiple, but one unique solution. Uh, what are the constraints? The constraints on U and V is that they are column orthonormal. So what does it mean? It means that every column is orthogonal and unit length. Okay, so normal means it's a unit length. It has Euclidean length one. And orthogonal means that if you take dot product of two columns, you get zero. What does this mean? This means that if you take, um, uh, if you take the matrix and multiply it with itself, you will get an identity matrix. Why? Because every two vectors are orthogonal, they multiply to a zero. And whatever is on the diagonal, it means you take the vector and multiply it with itself, and you get its Euclidean length squared. So if the Euclidean length is one, then the length squared equals one as well. So you get ones on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. This is called the ad identity matrix, okay? And then our matrix sigma is diagonal, which means that the entries, which we call singular values are positive, right? And the way we will think of these singular values, we'll think of them as sorted in decreasing order. So we'll say sigma one is the biggest, sigma two is the, the second biggest all the way, and they are all um, greater than or equal to zero. So they are all positive, okay? So that's the idea. Now I wanna give you first example. Uh, here is the example I was able to come up with. This is, imagine this is a matrix where every row is a user and every column is a different movie. I hope uh, I'm not too old and you recognize these movies. So, um, right, the idea is that this particular user gave this particular set of ratings for, to these three movies. And, you know, some other user gave this particular ratings 
two, you know, these two movies, and they also rated the alien movie, okay? And now the question is, if I take this as my data matrix and I do the decomposition, um, what is it going to happen, right? And the idea is that these uh, rows and columns of U and V will somehow define me the concepts along which the data varies a lot, right? So it will give me what is called latent dimensions or latent factors. And if you think of this data set, it seems that there are two types of movies, right? Or two types of people. There are people who like these three movies, and there are people who kind of watch these movies. And there's very few people who watch both, uh, uh, from both categories, right? So this latent dimensions, latent concepts, should reveal something about the structure of our data. So now, if I type this up and, um, and use my favorite linear algebra library to do my, to call my singular value decomposition function, here is what I get, right? So if I take this matrix, here is my u, here is my sigma, and here is my v transpose. Uh, as we said, uh, all, these, uh, all these columns are um, unit length. They are orthogonal. Um, c c matrix sigma is diagonal, right? I have zeros and only non-zeros on diagonal. Singular values are greater than zero, and they are sorted in the decreasing order, okay? Um, so this is, this is the decomposition. So now the question is, what does it mean? But you have a bigger question first. Did you truncate the, the three points there? Did I truncate to three points? Oh, why did I get only three points? Why, ah, great. Why, did, why do I only have three and I don't have five? Because there's five columns here. The reason is, is because this matrix has rank three, right? Why does it have rank three? Because, you know, I have rows of this type. I have rows of this type plus these two errors. So I need, I have kind of three types of rows. So that's why I, ha I got only three, because the rest is zero. The rank of this matrix is three, it's not five. So it's not a full rank matrix. So that's a great question, thank you, right? So this is, if I want, and now of course if I multiply these matrices together, I get this matrix. So this is now exact, and it, so the rank of the matrix is three, so I have three singular values, uh, th three singular vectors and three singular values, right? If now there, there would be more, like if this wouldn't be so nicely done as, as, as I did it beautifully, right? Then yes, in general, if this would be a random matrix, you would get all five here, but it's not. You see it has some structure embedded, very mysterious, all okay? right? Good, thank you for the question, great. So. The, now that we know why we only have three, this was super cool, um, let's figure out what does this all mean, right? So now you can start saying, okay, what does, what does it mean, right? It means that, for example, the first, the left singular vector kind of for every user tells me how much does it belong to a, let's say, different concept, right? It seems that this seems like this is the science fiction concept, science fiction topic. And uh, you know the first uh, three, uh, the first four users seem to belong uh, to it quite a bit. And then there is this other uh, concept called uh, Romans, where this, where these last movies, um, so, uh, last users here belong to it, right? And then there is you know something else. Okay, that's the first thing. The second, uh, the second thing is that you can think of the value here. Um, Right, this kind of tells you how users belong to these concepts. How much does user number one belong to the first concept, second concept, third concept, right? So it seems that this, this first four belong a lot to the first concept, and then, you know, the last three have high values here, right? So they belong to that one, even though the values, the values are negative, right? Um, so that's the first thing. So the way we think of the matrix U is the user to concept uh, matrix. Okay, then what are the, what do the singular values tell me? Singular values tell me how strong, how important a given concept or a latent dimension is, right? So it tells me that the first two are very important, but the last one is really not, right? Because if you look at this, it's essentially two types of people plus a bit of noise, right? So this last concept is very weak. Right? So in some sense, the way you can also think of this is what is variability along a given dimension? And there is a lot of variability here and here and much less there. Okay, so that's the, that's the intuition. And then 
Um, what is the matrix V? Matrix V is movie to concept matrix, right? If I have these movies, then V tells me how much does each movie belong to each concept, right? And it tells me that the, that the first three movies really belong to the first concept. The la second two movies, so movies four and five belong to the second concept. And then this last one tells me that this uh, movie number two belongs a lot to it, right? So there are the first three movies. They belong to our first concept, so the science fiction. Then we have the last two movies. Here they are, because um, uh, right, they belong to our Romans com um, um, concept. And then there is this weird movie uh, number two that the only it belongs strongly to this third concept, right? So this is here where we have these two guys, right? So. That's the second movie, right? So what this means is that matrix V is the movie to concept fate factor matrix. Yes? Uh, how do we interpret the sign for each value? How do we interpret the sign? Um, just essentially ignore it. It doesn't matter. If something points this way, then it can point that way as well, right? So it's okay. So think of magnitudes more than the signs, right? Like I can define that way or that way, but the coordinates are just flip over, right? So good, good point, okay? So what did we, what did we, what is the first interpretation for SVD? Is that we have this kind of movies, users, and concepts. So I can think of user to be, a, of you to be a user to concept matrix, V to be a movie to concept matrix, and sigma, uh, its diagonal elements kind of tell me the strength of each of these concepts, okay? So now this is what we did. What we did so far, is that we took our original matrix and we used singular value de decomposition to decompose it into a, a product of three matrices. And the important thing is that here is a equality sign. So if you multiply these matrices together, you will get back exactly these values, like exactly the values. So this is equals. But when we do dimensionality reduction, we will uh, incur a bit of error, right? So the idea is if I have my data uh, spread in some dimensions, then you know I want to find the axis of maxima maximal variation. So I want to identify this axis, and if I decide to do um, dimensionality reduction, then um, you know whatever. Uh, then this means that this particular data point would be would be um, projected down to uh, to my to my axis. So when I would reconstruct it, I would incur a bit of error, right? So in some sense. If I want to dim do dimensionality reduction on this data, instead of, instead of using two coordinates, x and y, to describe the point, I could decide to only use one coordinate, which would be kind of the distance along this line from the origin, right? But this means, if I do that, that I will incur a bit of error, because obviously I cannot reconstruct this point. I would have to project it here, okay? So that's the, that's the idea. So how does SVD discover these uh, latent dimensions and how do we then do uh, dimensionality reduction, right? So far, notice we haven't done any dimensionality reduction because we can directly reconstruct this. So there is no dimensionality reduction going on. Just like something that seemed like five dimensional data is really three dimensional data. But we still are exactly um, uh, uh, reconstructing that thing, right? Now I gave you, I asked before, what are the dimensions, what are the coordinates of these latent dimensions? The, the V transpose gives me the coordinates of these latent dimensions. These are the latent dimensions, right? So these are the coordinates of the red arrow, if you want to think of it that way. And then, you know, these are the coordinates of the, of the arrow that's uh, orthogonal to the red one. And this is yet another that's orthogonal to the first two, okay? So that's the idea. So as we said before, right, we said that singular values, their magnitude tells me what's the variance along that dimension. So one sensible strategy um, to, um, uh, that, that, um, that we can, uh, that what we can do is now that we have the variance that tells me what is the spread along a given axis, I can take my um, uh, user to concept matrix and multiply it with my sigma matrix, right? And if I do that, then what I get is the coordinates I get are now the projection of the points on the, um, on my, on my projection axis, right? So if I take u times sigma, then here is, here is the matrix I get, 
right? And what would this mean is that this is now projection of users on the sci-fi axis, on the Romans axis, and on the third axis, right? So this is the sci-fi concept, the Romans concept, and you know, whatever, whatever else this, this is. And you see that, for example, this user number four is kind of the farthest along uh, or uh, along this, this concept, while this first one is kind of um, not too far from the origin. And the reason for that is that this person gave very high ratings to all three movies, while the first person gave uh, low ratings uh, to the three movies, right? Um, and then, you know, for the second axis for the Romans, again, you can compare the, the distances here, and they correspond to the magnitude of ratings uh, there, okay? So that's the first thing. Now, let's ask, how do we really do dimensionality reduction, right? So if I take my data matrix, do singular value decomposition, and I want to do further dimensionality reduction. And the way I do this is quite simple. Opa. Uh, the way I do is I zero out some singular values. So I go, so what am I saying is if I want to now take this original matrix and, and uh, project it down to only two dimensions, the way I do this is I compute SVD and then I zero out the smaller or the smallest singular values. So here I could zero out 1.3. So I can replace a zero here. And if I replace a zero here, then what this means that I'm eff effectively removing this guy and I'm effectively removing that guy from my, from my matrices. So now let's assume I take this skinny two column matrix multiplied by with this two by two matrix and then multiply it with this, what do I get? And here is what I get, right? What, oh, it's not yet. Okay, so animations, right? Because I will zero this thing out, now my equality sign becomes not necessarily equality, but something close. And then, because, as I said, because I zero out the 1.3, this means essentially I remove this column and I remove this row. So now I'm representing every data point rather than using three coordinates, I'm representing it using only two coordinates, right? And now if I do, um, right, and if I do this, this is now what are the matrices I will multiply, right? They are smaller. And if I multiply them, uh, here is what I get, okay? So this is the matrix I get. And what do I want you to see? You want, I want you to see that this is the mate, this is now the reconstruction, reconstructed version of my original matrix. But notice that this reconstructed version is quite good, right? What does it mean that, for example, this row of 55500 got reconstructed to, you know, 4.8, 5, 4.8, and something very close to zero? Or, for example, you know, this row of 0, 1, uh, 0, 2, 2 gets reconstructed to things that are close to zero and then things that are close to two, right? So this reconstructed matrix um, is quite close to the original data matrix. Even though original data matrix was three dimensional, it was rank three, and now we are approximating it with a rank two matrix, okay? Or a rank two set of matrices. And as, as we do that, um, our reconstruction is close, but is not perfect. So um, now the question is, you know, I just zeroed out here some singular values, right, the smallest ones, and uh, you know, why did I do that? And is this principle then, you know, why didn't we zero out some other ones? You can, you can easily ask, right? And the point is that, that the reconstruction error, which is measured by the Frobenius norm between these two matrices. And Frobenius norm, I define it here, is nothing else than basically Euclidean distance between two matrices, right? So you take uh, corresponding cells in the two matrices, you, 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 you uh, subtract them, take a square, sum over all the cells, and take a square root. So in some sense, it's a Euclidean distance between two matrices, if you want to think of it that way, right? And what is the, what is the super cool fact? The super cool fact is that the reconstruction error um, um, uh, that can be quantified by the Frobenius norm is as low as possible, okay? So let me quantify what I mean by that. So what did we learn so far? Um, what we learned so far is that I can take some matrix A here, 
right? And I can decompose it into these three matrices, right? And then we said, let me now um, uh, take my decomposition, set some uh, singular values to zero, which basically means I kind of gray out this part of the matrix, and then I gray out these two other parts of the matrices. And I, if I multiply now these things together, I get a different matrix B. And now I ask, what is the difference between A and B? And it turns out that SVD gives you the best possible way to do dimensionality reduction, right? So if I do dimensionality reduction this way, then the difference, the Frobenius norm between A and B will be minimized, okay? So um, what, does, what, does, what does it mean to be, to, be, to be minimized? It means that along all possible ways, how to represent my matrix A using some, let's say, uh, K dimensions, this is the best way to do it. So it's the best, so it's the minimum Frobenius norm approximation of the original matrix with a rank K matrix, okay? So SVD in some sense is optimal, right? So what did we learn so far? We learned that SVD is unique. We learned um, um, how, how uh, um, what is the, the rank of the matrix R. And uh, we will talk more about how do you select the number of dimensions in which you wanna project. And um, what are we going uh, to do is uh, now talk about how would you actually go and compute singular value decomposition if somebody didn't hand you in a linear algebra uh, library, okay? Are there any questions before I go into how to compute things? All right, so, so far we should have a good kind of intuition and understanding what this is. Now let's talk about how do we compute it, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna compute the singular value decomposition. So what we need is we need to find, um, uh, uh, before I show you this, I need to tell you how if you take a square uh, symmetric matrix, how do you find the principal eigenvalue in, and the corresponding eigenvector, right? So I'm taking some matrix M that is real valued and symmetric. Symmetric means that it's symmetric across the diagonal, right? That Mij, so the cell Ij, has the same value as the cell Ji, right? So it's kind of flipped across the diagonal, right? And how do you, what's an easy way to find the principal eigenvector and the, the principal eigenvalue is that you start with some guess of your eigenvector, let's call it Sx0, and uh, then you, you iterate the following iteration, you say, I'll start with x0, I'll multiply it with my matrix M, I will divide by the length of that resulting product, and this is my new guess. And I keep iterating this, right? Um, and I will stop when this xk uh, stops changing, okay? And this method is called power iteration. And just to give you an example how this would work, if I have my matrix M and my guess for the eigenvector to be one, one, um, then, you know, the first iteration would be M times X zero divided by the length of, of the X zero. So here is my new, my, my new X one. Now I can take my X one and multiply it with M again and divide by the Euclidean length of that, uh, of that product. Here is the math. This would be my X two and so on and so forth. But notice, that, you know, it seems it's already starting to stabilize, right? So if I were to, um, to run this uh, a bit longer, basically it would converge to the, to the vector very close to this one. And this would be my first eigenvector. So now the question is, how do I find the corresponding eigenvalue, right? Um, how do I, and the way I find the eigenvalue is, is given here, so my eigenvalue that corresponds to the eigenvector x is simply that I take x transpose m times x. Um, why is that the case? The derivation is easy. All you have to remember that def by definition eigenvalues are um, lambda x equals m times x, right? If m is an eigenvalue and x is an eigenvector. So if I uh, multiply uh, the, the above equation from the right with x transpose, then I get x transpose tri times x times lambda, x transpose times x equals one because eigenvectors are unit length, so this will be one. And then on the right hand side I get x transpose times m times x, right? So it's exactly what I had above. 
So it's a very simple thing, right? So now if my eigenvector x is like this, then if I compute my product, I will see that the corresponding eigenvalue is uh, 4.25. So we just found the, cor the first principal eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue, okay? So now how do you compute the second and the third eigenvector and the eigenvalue? The idea is the following, right? Basically the idea is that I co I'm able to compute the first and then I can a I'm able to eliminate the portion of the matrix M that can be generated by the first eigenpair. So what do I do? I say my new matrix M, uh, M star, let's see, maybe we do it this way, right? My first, my new matrix M star is M minus the outer product of the vector X with itself times the value of the, of the, of the eigenvalue, right? So basically I'm saying this is what, th this is the, the, the amount of space variation that the first eigenvector captures. So I just uh, subtract that from the matrix M and that's my new matrix. And now I can take my matrix M star and run the same thing again and I will find the second eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue. And I can keep the doing and I'll do the entire, um, and I can obtain this entire decomposition. This is not the most efficient way to do it, but it's a very easy way to do it. Yes? Uh, is power iteration this way guaranteed to work no matter how bad your initial guess is? Uh, yes. Um, we, yes with probability one, or yes with probability that approaches to one. You can come up with a super bad guess, or what could happen is that your guess is, if you are lucky that your guess is a seventh eigenvector, then it will, it, it won't change. But if your vector is random, right, so if it's not one of these finitely many bad choices, and there is infinitely many other random choices, then yes, with probability one or with probability approaching to one, it will always converge. Was there a question? No? All right, good. So um, we, I told you how to do eigenvalues and uh, eigenvectors, but we wanna do singular value decomposition. So how do I do singular value decomposition? Uh, yes? Like what eigenvector are you finding? Like uh, always the biggest one. Okay. Um, and there is a beautiful proof um, in the in the book that tells you why does it always converge to the biggest one? Um, yeah, I don't have time to do it. B the one with the biggest corresponding eigenvalue. Yes. Because you might have a huge data set, do you run this on a sample of your data set to figure out the eigenvector and then apply it later? No, you don't have to. You can run this on on MapReduce. Like you can run this over your entire data set, right? Uh, as we will see later in the class. Google is running this on entire web graph every day or even more often than every day. So this is amazingly scalable because usually I know you need a couple of iterations, maybe 10 or whatever, and you converge. So the matrix can be as big as you want, right? You can just keep loading it from this because it's so simple, right? It doesn't require any random accesses, nothing. Good point. Oh, hey, good. So, uh, what did, what do, what do I wanna, uh, what do I wanna do? I wanna do SVD, right? So um, the way we do this is that I, I wanna compute A and decompose it into this U sigma V transpose. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll do some linear algebra here to show you uh, how this can be done, right? First I'll ask um, what is A transpose, right? And I say if I have the decomposed version, then I have the transpose sign there, I will distribute it inside, right? And, and uh, because of the rule of transposition, the order of the product changes and my uh, uh, transpose sign um, distributes inside. And then, you know, V transpose transpose is V, sigma transpose is sigma because sigma is diagonal, so it, nothing happens, and U transpose remains U transpose. Okay, so now I said, I computed to you uh, what is the decomposition of A transpose. So now, what I do is as a second step of my derivation, I take A transpose times A. So I already know how to decompose A. Here is the SVD decomposition. This is the SVD decomposition of um, A transpose. So now let's see what happens. And what happens is that uh, U transpose times U is a, is a identity matrix, right? Because um, uh, columns of U are unit length and orthogonal, so, so U is orthonormal. So U times U transpose gives, it, gives me an identity matrix. So this goes away. Um, sigma is a diagonal matrix. So sigma times sigma is just sigma squared. 
and this is what I'm left with. Okay, so I'm left with if I take A8 transpose and do the singular value decomposition of it, then what I'm left, what I, what I, what the result is, is V sigma square V transpose. Okay, so um, what does, what can I, what can now, I now do is um, I can now take my A8 transpose and multiply it from the left with V. And again, if I do this on the left hand side, I get that. But uh, on the right hand side, what I get is I get V, I get the sigma transpose. Here I multiply by, by V, again V transpose times V is an identity matrix, so this thing disappears. Okay, so I did kind of three steps um, of the, of the, um, of my, of my calculation, right? So um, what does this mean now, right? What this means now is that essentially I can, I can, um, uh, if I look at, um, the equation up here, what really this is, is this is, you know, my, my, this is basically eigen decomposition, if you think of it that way, of my matrix A transpose times A. So this means that um, I can take my A transpose times A, this is my data matrix, I multiply it with the transpose of itself from the left hand side, and I can use my power iteration to find the eigenvectors of this, of this matrix. And those eigenvectors will be the vectors I put in V. And then the eigenvalues, they will correspond to sigma squared. So this means that the eigen, eigenvalues uh, I find are the squares of the singular values, right? So I can take the square roots and I will get the, the singular values, right? And now by very similar argument, um, if I would start with A times A transpose and do the eigen decomposition of it, I would obtain the matrix U and again matrix sigma squared, right? So I can use this eigen decomposition to, um, to compute SVD. Of course, there are much more advanced and much better um, methods that allow us to do this, that, you know, the field of um, uh, linear algebra and scientific computing has been working on for 30, 60 years. Uh, but this is one simple way how you could compute this, you know, if kind of you are on a desert island with a computer, no, no linear algebra al library, then in this kind of survival situation, this is what you would do, okay? If you have to do it to survive, yes? It might be a little less semi-linear algebra, but is A transpose A here symmetric? Yes. Yes, exactly. Good point. Okay, great. So um, what are, now if you use the, if you are not on a desert island and you, you have access to linear algebra specialized methods for computing SVD, what is the complexity? The complexity is basically um, a square of the value in one dimension times whatever is the other dimension. So in some sense, the, the complexity is n times m squared or n squared times m, whichever is less, okay? Um, right, but of course, this is to do the full decomposition. But if you can do less work if you just want the singular values or if you want the first case singular ve uh, uh, vectors and corresponding values, if matrices are sparse and so on and so forth, right? Um, and the implementation of these specialized methods are in something called LIMPAC, there is one in MATLAB, there is in S plus, in Mathematica and so on and so forth. So generally, we would take this decomposition as given and we wouldn't implement it ourselves and these specialized methods can scale quite well, okay? So what I wanna do now is I wanna give you an example of how this SVD would work in practice and what it would teach us and then I wanna talk about the COR decomposition. Um, and we have half an hour to do that so it should be good. Um, are there any questions before I move on? You guys were asking me really good questions, so, so thank you for that so far. But if you have more, just raise your hand. You have a question? No? Okay. So if you have, raise the hand and I'll, I'll be happy to answer. So um, going back to my uh, users and movies example, um, the question is, right, um, I would like to find users that, that like the movie Matrix, right? And the question is how would I do that, right? And how would I do this is to take the query and map it into the concept space, right? And then do comparison there, right? So how do I find users that, that, that like or would like a movie matrix, right? So imagine what is my query? 
my query is the following point, right? I have my five movies and I like, I would like to find people who are similar to the following vector. They really like movie matrix and you know, the rest I don't care, right? So the way I can think of this is that along, if I live in some latent dimensions, then if this is the matrix concept, I have this query point Q and I want to kind of do the nearest neighbor here, right? But I don't want to do that directly over the, over the, over the, the ambient space, but I want to do this in this projected, uh, this dimensionality reduced space. So how do I do this is that I want to take this vector Q and project it into my, uh, uh, lower dimensional, uh, concept space. Um, and then I can, uh, and the way I do this, I do the inner product with each concept vector, uh, V. Okay. So, um, right. And as I make that, I'm essentially figuring out in this new coordinate system, what is the, what is the position of my node, uh, of my query, query point Q. Okay. So let's do that. Let's, uh, we have our original, um, uh, matrix. Let's take a two dimensional, um, dimensionality reduced uh, version of it. So here is my movie to concept, uh, factors or, uh, singular vectors, uh, V. I have my query point. I multiply it. Here is now my query point Q in this concept space, in this embedding space, right? It has two coordinates, 2.8 and 0.6, right? And this is now expressed in this two dimensional concept space where we had, uh, the first dimension we called sci-fi and the second dimension we called Romans, right? And, and you see how this gets mapped into that. Okay. Um, now how do I map, uh, um, uh, a user that let's say rated alien in serenity to be very high. I can also map that user into the concept space, right? So here is my user. They haven't rated anything else yet. They just rated these two movies. Again, here is my uh, movie to concept, uh, um, factor matrix. I do the multiplication and these are the coordinates of that, of that user, right? So 5.2 and 0.4, right? So why, why is this so cool? The reason this is so cool is because I have a user and a query point that have nothing in common. They seem to be like, I don't know what to do with this, right? This user likes these movies. This query point says, find me users who like this. I cannot measure distance between these two points well in this, in this space. But as I move it into this concept space, it becomes clear that, that, um, uh, D and Q are quite close, right? And really what is this doing? It is, it is, um, exploiting correlations in data, right? Essentially by doing our embedding, uh, into the embedding space using this movie to concept, uh, matrix, it allows me to map these two points that in this space seem to be amazingly far apart into something that is very close in the embedding space. And why, why, why does, why is it embedded close is because if you look in our data matrix, there is this correlation that whoever liked these two movies also like that one and the other way around, right? And our way of embedding things kind of says whatever the coordinates here are, I will just map you close, even if some of them are missing because the correlations between them are so strong, right? So it means that the query and the user D get mapped close together, even though in the original space, they seem to be very far apart, right? Because of the correlations or dependencies between these ratings. And that's what is so cool about SVD that in some sense smooths out and gets rid of the noise in the data. Right? It reduces dimensionality and it removes this low, di low dimensional high frequency noise. You can think of it that way and allows us to compare things that the, the original space would seem very far, but in reality, they are really not. Okay. And that's kind of what I wanted to show you are about SVD. So what are some drawbacks of, um, SVD? So the first, maybe not what's the drawbacks, what are the advantages of SVD? The first advantage of SVD that it's an optimal low rank approximation. What does this mean? This means if I have a matrix A and I want to decompose it into some product of rank K matrices, then the way we, then basically the optimal way to do that is to take the matrix A, decompose it, set the, the smallest singular values to zero, multiply that back together, and that gives you the best approximation to the original matrix. So essentially 
What this means is that SVD gives you the optimal reconstruction or the minimal reconstruction error um, of any method under the Frobenius norm. So SVD is optimal in terms of reconstructing data under the Frobenius norm. So it will basically give you the, the reconstruction that has the lowest error, right? Of course, uh, having the, 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 the rank constraint. If you say over all possible reconstructions with a given rank, SVD gives you the smallest error. That's, that's guaranteed and that's, that's why this is so awesome. Uh, what are some issues? One issue is what people call interpretability problem. And the problem is that the singular vectors specifies some linear combination of all input columns and rows, right? Um, and it was, this, this second point is very similar to what we were talking about uh, uh, on Tuesday when we talked about clustering and we said, oh, if you're in Euclidean space, you can take the centroid. But if you are not in Euclidean space, you have to take the clustroid because we don't know how to average points. And this is in some sense a very similar point, right? Like in, in SVD, um, the, the, these uh, uh, concepts um, are some arbitrary vectors. And when we want to go and interpret them, we, we don't know how to interpret them. We give them some interpretation. You know, I called one sci-fi and I called the other Romans because I know what the movies that I selected were and I can make that interpretation. But it's kind of completely interpreted and, 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 made, and made up in some sense, right? So what this means is that these singular vectors are linear combinations of all input rows and columns. So it gets complicated to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to interpret them. And then the last thing to say, if my input matrix is very sparse, my SVD will be dense. Meaning all these, like even if I have a matrix where most is zeros and only these are non-zeros, when I do the decomposition, basically every element of uh, U uh, and V will be non-zero. So I get from something that is amazingly sparse to something that can be quite dense or that is dense, okay? Um, and that may be a drawback because you took something that's amazingly sparse and now represented it with these bulky um, dense vectors, okay? Those are the two disadvantages. Um, are there any questions? Sorry, maybe I was rushing the first part of the lecture too quickly, but I was worried I won't be able to finish. But now I see I have time, sorry. So maybe you should uh, ask me all the questions you wanted to, to ask me, but you were not able because I was going too fast. Yes? Can you go back to the last slide? So here, like, uh, when you're projecting like, that second person into this concept. So that's the query and that's the person, mm -hmm. yeah? You're, you're uh, treating this person as a person who's like, uh, rated the matrix of five and yeah. like said that he doesn't like anything else. Um, or they haven't yet rated anything, but I don't. Like when you're doing the projection, you're multiplying zeros and like, you know, you're not. Yes. Like, it's, That's a it's great like point. the math is not aware that he does, it doesn't have opinions about the other movies. It's treating him like he gave them zeros. That's an amazingly good point. This is a super excellent point, right? Like, and we'll talk about exactly this point on Tuesday. Right? But what you, what's the observation you are making is I have these zeros here. And the math thinks that I rated all these movies zero. But really, I haven't rated them, right? There should be kind of question marks, underscores, stars, whatever. I don't care. I want people who will like this thing. And then the same way as we think here, right? Rating zero generally doesn't exist. It's rating one that exists, right? So the math is not aware of missing versus zero, okay? Uh, but still, right, because of this, if I compare these two things here, I would say this and this user have nothing in common, right? Even if I would write a custom similarity function that would say how similar are these two users, right? You say, do they have any ratings in common where I'd say, yes, they have something in common. They have zero in common. So there's no way I could, you know, for this query say, this is, this is the candidate, right? But when I do this projection, here, it's clear they have something in common, right? So even though the math is not aware of these zeros, it kind of mitigates this because it's almost like filling in the data here and it's filling in the data here because of the correlations, right? So that's what you ask is a, 
is, is amazingly good question. It's a clever question. Uh, and we are going to address it next week very carefully. All right? So it's great. Super. Good. So continuing our journey, we, I will now talk about the second method that tries to fix this issue of uh, SVD. And the method is called CUR decomposition, okay? So um, what is CUR decomposition? CUR decomposition tries to take the matrix A and decompose it into a product of sparse matrices, right? So the idea is that it is common that matrix A, we want to decompose it into something that is sparse. And U and V from the singular value decomposition will not be sparse. They are dense. D dense means every cell is non-zero, right? And sparse means we want most of the cells of the matrix to be zero, right? And CUR, the way it solves this problem, is by using only a randomly chosen rows and columns of A. So this will be a randomized algorithm, and it will give us kind of U and V. Here they will be called C and R that are sparse, okay? So the idea is if A is sparse, then our basis vectors, our singular vectors, will also be sparse. So let me uh, give, you the, give you the example. Um, the idea is the following, right? I want to take, uh, I want to take my matrix uh, A, and I want to decompose it as a product of matrices C, U, and R, and I want to make this Frobenius norm between the A and my approximation to be small, okay? So the way I will um, represent this is to say I have my data matrix, I have C, I have U, and I have R, and here is kind of how I will construct things. So uh, the way I will construct this is that C will simply be some set of randomly chosen columns from my A, okay? And uh, similarly, my uh, R will be a set of randomly, but carefully, chosen rows from my matrix uh, A, okay? So, you know, in, in SVD, this was computed and this was computed, but now in CUR, we'll just sample some columns and throw them into C, and we'll sample some rows and throw them into R, okay? Um, but what will be different is that matrix U won't be diagonal. So matrix U won't be like, ma won't be like matrix sigma that was diagonal. Matrix U will be a dense matrix. And it will be something that is called pseudo-inverse of the intersection of C and R. I will explain what this means, okay? Um, but this is the idea. The idea is that I'm decomposing by selecting random rows, random columns, and then I do a bit of computation to compute uh, U. So let me now explain what is a pseudo-inverse. Right? So the first thing is I'll define this matrix W that is the intersection of the sam sampled rows and columns from R. What do I mean by that? If you have your matrix A and you sample a couple of columns and you sample a couple of rows, then um, wherever these uh, rows and columns intersect, so these dark green squares, those are your, uh, you throw those into matrix A. Okay? So it's wherever your rows and columns intersect, that's your, sorry, that's your matrix W, okay? Now that you have the W, you um, uh, can uh, uh, define W plus to be the pseudo-inverse of W. And the way you compute pseudo-inverse is the following. You say, I'll take my W and I will compute SVD of it. So I will decompose it into S, Z, sorry, into X, Z, and Y. Just I'm not using S sigma, uh, U sigma, and V. I'm using X, Z, and Y. Um, and then I will compute uh, the pseudo inverse of W. I'll call it here V plus to be Y times Z plus times X transposed. Now, what is Z plus? The way I define Z plus, Z plus is 1 over Z. Okay? So, uh, to decompose this a bit more for you, right? So what did we do? We took this uh, matrix W, we did the pseudo in we, we computed the SVD, Z, uh, Z is a di diagonal matrix of our singular values, uh, and now we, we said that we'll compute this matrix V plus, that is simply the matrix Y, times this matrix Z plus, which is where I basically just take the singular values and take one over one over them, 
and then I multiply that with x transpose. And I'll call this pseudo inverse. Now, you may ask me, why do you call this a pseudo inverse? And here's the reason why we call this uh, the pseudo uh, inverse. Here it is, right? Basically, the idea is if I have w, imagine w is now um, uh, 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 square and, and symmetric so that inverse exists, then if I do the SVD of w, then, you know, what is the SVD of the inverse of, if I take w and now invert it on the left, and now I also do the inverse of the, of the SVD, uh, this is what I get. And then, due to orthonormality, the inverse of matrix X is simply X transpose, and the inverse of Y is simply Y transpose. Again, I'm here using X and Y, but this is really um, uh, uh, U, and this is V, and this is sigma from what we had before, right? So now, if this is my SVD decomposition, and I take the inverse on both hands, I get uh, inverse of V of W, and then if I take the inverse of this entire thing, it will simplify into Y transpose inverse of it, inverse of Z, and inverse of X. Inverse of X is X transpose, inverse of Y is Y transpose, and then what is the inverse of Z? Z is a diagonal matrix, so the inverse of Z is just one over the values on the diagonal, okay? So what, what is this long way of saying? Um, it is a long way of saying basically that if W has an inverse, then the pseudo inverse that we computed, right, is uh, exactly the inverse. But um, if W is singular, which means if W doesn't have the, the properly computed inverse, then the pseudo inverse is as close to the inverse as you can compute, okay? So that's essentially what this means, right? So if W is square, then pseudo inverse equals the real inverse. And if W doesn't have the inverse, then the, the pseudo inverse is kind of a approximation of the inverse of the matrix, okay? So now that I explain this, I have to explain um, how do we decide what rows and columns to sample, okay? So how do I choose rows and columns? Are there questions here? Hopefully people follow that, okay? Yes? Yeah? All right, right? Um, and you should, yeah, that's all good, okay? And you should see how this thing is actually that thing, right? It's X transpose Z to the, Z to the minus one, which is Z plus, and Y transpose transpose is Y, right? Okay, good. So how do I sample rows and columns? Um, the idea is we want to decrease the amount of error between A and its decomposition, right? And in order to do this, we must select these rows and columns in a non-uniform way. And the way we'll do this is that we will compute the importance of a row to be a square of its Frobenius norm. So it's basically for a given row, you just take the values, square them, and sum them up, okay? Um, so this is basically the sum of the squares of the elements of a given row or of a given column. And the idea is that we wanna, when we are picking rows or when we are picking columns, we will, uh, we, we will pick them with the probability that's proportional to their importance, meaning it's proportional to the square of their Frobenius norm. Um, right, so the idea is if I have a given row with values three, four, five, then this will have in importance 50 because that's 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared. And then if I have some other uh, row that has 3, 0, 1, then its importance will be 10 because that's 3 squared plus 0 squared plus 1 squared, right? So probability of me picking this row will be 5 times bigger than the probability of me picking that row, okay? That's the idea. And why would I want to do this is, right, if you think about reconstruction error, I want low Frobenius norm. So if I pick rows with high Frobenius norm, they will reconstruct those rows well, and these short rows that don't add too much to my error, I won't sample them so often. So I won't reconstruct them so well. Yes? Do you have to use some sort of normalization across rows and columns? Like if I have one column that represents kilometers per hour and one column that represents like uh, miles per hour, those are on different scales. And so the, the kilometers per hour is gonna have a different like average or different 
like scaling to it than the other column. That's a great, what you ask, right, you are asking, do I need to normalize columns somehow because they might be in units that are not comparable? Um, that may, the answer is yes and no. So the, 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 the blunt answer is that's, that's not a, a CUR's problem, that's your problem. Right, what CUR's problem is to give you low Frobenius norm reconstruction. Now, if you don't care about reconstructing one column more accurately than the other column, then yes, you would want to renormalize those columns to be in the same units. But that's a kind of an application problem, a domain problem, not a mathematical problem. So your, your question and your intuition is exactly correct. Um, and in some sense, yes, you are right, but this is not trying to solve. You have to solve it as a scientist, as a domain expert. Okay? Great. So now, what is our algorithm to sample columns? And very similar will be for rows. So basically, all it's saying is, for every, for every uh, column, let's compute the square of its Frobenius norm. So I'm just running over all the, all the, all the, um, uh, over uh, all the, uh, all the, all the columns. I'm uh, um, uh, uh, adding up the squares. This is the normalization factor, so this is the probability for me to, to pick a simple column. And then uh, I'm saying, now I'm go and I will go and I will sample um, the C columns. I'm just basically picking a number based on this uh, distribution, and I, uh, and I take out uh, that particular uh, column, and I, uh, and I save it, okay? Um, and what is rough intuition why we want to do this, right? Our kind of rough and imprecise intuition why we want to sample columns with high Frobenius norm is that CUR is more likely to pin pick points that are far away from, coordin from uh, um, ori coordinate origin, right? So if we assume smooth data and out no outliers, these are the variations, these are dimensions of maximum variation, right? So if I think of singular vector to, to, you know, to do something like this, if I have data like that, Right? Then, you know, I, I'm more likely to pick, in this case, uh, data points that are farther away that have high Frobenius norms. So I'm more likely to pick, I don't know, one of these three data points. So my CUR singular vector, you know, will be w how, how this uh, red vector is, right? And, uh, you know, if I have, uh, um, I don't know, more complicated data, I will again pick two different columns and they will likely be like I show here in red, right? So basically the idea is that if we have two clouds at an angle, then what, sing what SVD will do, it will co co uh, uh, identify the two black lines, right? Because the first one is the direction of maximum variance, and it will go kind of in the center, and then the second one has to be orthogonal to it. So it will point into this useless direction. But if you do CUR, chances are that you will pick uh, something that looks like this, right? So, you know, you pick one, di one, one dimension, and then you pick kind of the other dimension, and they are not orthogonal, but we don't care, right? So that's the, uh, that's the difference. So now, um, what, does the, what does the math say? I w uh, the math says the following. The math says that this CUR decomposition is provably good approximation to SVD. And the idea is the following, right? Uh, if you select, imagine you have a rank K, K-dimensional, um, um, uh, uh, SVD of a given data matrix. And this is saying, if you pick K log K columns, and if you pick K log K rows of this A, um, and you compute the CUR decomposition, then the difference between the matrix A and, uh, and, uh, and your reconstructed version of matrix A will be some, some factor times uh, the, uh, here I denote the S error of SVD, right? So this is my A, and this is the optimal approximation of A of rank K, okay? So let's try to think again, what does this mean? So I'm saying if I want an approximation of rank K, I need to, I need to sample K log K rows, I need to sample K log K columns, and the difference between the actual data and my approximation will be two plus epsilon times the optimal error, right? So this is 
the best I could do because SVD is the best rank K approximation and I'm doing at most two times worse, all right? So what this is saying is that I am inside a factor two of the what SVD can do, right? My error is at most two times the error of SVD. Um, SVD is of rank K and I am of rank K log K, right? So I'm paying log K up here and I'm paying a factor two of error plus this epsilon, okay? Um, what do I do in practice? In practice, I would pick four time number of K's rows and columns to get a good rank K approximation, okay? That's the, that's the idea. Uh, people understand this? Yeah, great. Intuition for why uh, using the intersection and taking the inter the pseudo inverse of that is a correct way to set you. Uh, great. What's the inter why 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 is the what is the intuition why to take the intersection? There are a few intuitions. One one possible intuition would be that you can do this uh, because at the intersection these are the the high these are high values, right? Because this means that the row got chosen because of them and column got chosen because of them. So they are likely high magnitude values. So that's why taking the, taking that and taking the inverse of that is a good thing to do. Again, in hope to have low uh, error, okay? Good, so let me now tell you what are pros and cons of this method, right? This is easily interpretable because every, every axis is a real data point, so every, axis can be explained by a very clear given data point, right? So if you think about genes or if you think about movies or whatever, it's a particular movie that, that defines a given axis. So that's great. The second thing that's great is that the, these vectors are sparse. If your original data is sparse, then the data points you choose will also be sparse. It means you maintain the sparsity in the de decomposition. What is one um, uh, con? is that um, you, uh, you, you have duplicate rows and columns, right? So essentially uh, columns with large uh, Frobenius norms will be sampled many times. The way you can fix this is that basically you can rescale your data, right? That you don't take the duplicates, but um, uh, rescale a given row or a given column how often it was sampled. And that's, 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 that's an easy fix, right? So what's the, how does do, how do the SVD and CUR, uh, compare. Um, in SVD, let's say I have big but sparse matrix A, I can decompose it exactly into three uh, matrices, U sigma V transpose, where U is dense and big, V is dense and big, and sigma is sparse, uh, meaning diagonal, and small. Um, in CUR, we are decomposing into CU and R. Again, A is big and sparse. Here I should have an approximate sign. Um, uh, C and R are big but sparse because they are just columns and row from A and A is also big and sparse, but U is dense but small. So this is not big, so it's okay. And uh, I have, I think, uh, one, more, uh, one more example to give you how well, how well would these two, th do these two things work. Imagine I have the following, uh, uh, data matrix. I, there is this uh, service called DBLP that essentially stores all the publications of all the computer scientists, right? So, and uh, this means that you can create this matrix where let's say every row can be a, a scientist, an author, a computer scientist, and a column is a publication, right? And because computer scientists publish at a small set of conferences, but there is a huge universe of conferences, this uh, matrix is very sparse. Right, so AIJ would be the number of papers published by author I at conference J. And you can imagine that every author publishes, I know what, three, five conferences out of thousands of them. So it's very sparse. Uh, here we have almost half a million authors and let's say uh, uh, 3.6 uh, thousand conferences, okay? Um, and now we wanna reduce dimensionality of this matrix. And you can ask several questions. How much time does it take? What is the reconstruction error? And how much space memory do we need? And I'll give you two examples. Um, 
here is, here is the idea. Um, accuracy is, you know, kind of, it tells you what is your Frobenius norm. It tells you how, uh, how uh, what, what is the relative sum of squares, what is the relative Frobenius norm. So the, the bigger the accuracy, the lower the reconstruction error. And then y-axis is the, what they call space ratio, which is the out, uh, the, the amount of the output, the size of C, U, and R, or the size of um, S, uh, 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 U, sigma, and, and uh, V, uh, versus the number of entries in the, uh, ma uh, in the input matrix. And what this is trying to do is the following. It says, for a given accuracy, how many non-zero entries do you need? And what you see is that CUR requires much less information to maintain, uh, to maintain high accuracy, right? So this means that because the data is so sparse, CUR will be more kind of space efficient than SVD because SVD gives you these dense vectors. And of course, if you also ask how long, how, how much computation time does it take, uh, CUR is a very, is a very quick method. I'm just kind of randomly sampling. So it's much, much faster than SVD, right? So um, it's actually a good method to keep in mind uh, because it allows you to do mate, uh, dimensionality reduction very efficiently, very cheaply. Uh, but of course, what you are paying is you are paying uh, with, the, with, with, with some error, right? So if you would now say with a given d-dimensional representation, what is the error or what's the accuracy of CUR versus SVD for a given d-dimensional representation, SVD would have much lower error. But because the dimensions of CUR are sparse, you can blow up the dimensions and still have very low error and only need to keep a few non-zeros, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you, I know if I explained well, is that you can measure the efficiency two ways. You could say, I want k dimensions, and then SVD is optimal. It gives you minimum Frobenius norm with, uh, k, uh, with k dimensions. CUR won't come even close with k dimensions, but uh, because your dimensions in SVD are, are, uh, are dense, then you can create a sparse CUR that takes, I don't know, four times as many dimensions and gets close, if not better, in terms of the reconstruction error than SVD, because now it has more dimensions to work with, but those dimensions are sparse. Can yes? Can you do like queries? Like all the stuff you can do with SVD, can you do that with CUR? You could do similar things that you do with SVD, you can also do with CUR. Yeah, good question. Good. So this is what I wanted to tell you about uh, SVD before we go uh, and talk about recommender systems uh, next week, where we'll actually use a lot of this machinery. Yes? E-dimensions, suppose we have here an approximation. Can we take the SVD and then approximate with CUR and get good uh, accuracy? So you are saying, uh -huh. so you say, let me take the data, let me compute SVD, but now that I have SVD, let me do a CUR decomposition of it. Um, it's a good question, but here is, here's why this is not a good idea, okay? So let's, let's, uh, let's figure out, right? So why is it not a good idea? CUR works well if this guy is sparse. Because I'm just taking this sparse full of zeros, rows, and columns and throwing them here. But if I say, let me take U and V and now do CUR of them, for example, U and V are dense. So C and R will be dense. So it will be futile. All right, good point. Actually, it's a good question. It should be a homework question. Good, anything else? Great, yes. Can you also repeat what we do to ensure there are no duplicates in CUR? If you don't want duplicates, then what you do is, sorry, what happened? Okay, you go to my last slide of my presentation and uh, there is a beautiful paper I, I cite. Um, here is this one, less is more, compact matrix decomposition for large sparse graphs. Um, that explains what you do with duplicates. And essentially you just rescale things and everything is good. It's a simple solution. But the details are in this uh, paper. Okay, great. Let's finish here. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. <laughs>